When we begin discussing the business of Mr. Peabody, well, as we will see, it goes very deep and sounds familiar all the same. As I have mentioned before, let's look at their version of events using Wikipedia, which is simply a tool used to gain a base understanding of a subject in question. So is the Library of Congress, for example. There are many starting points on any research you do, so let's keep that in mind. In the 1840s, Mr. Peabody became persona non grata. And let's remember what that means. Quote, in diplomacy, a persona non grata is a status applied by a host country to foreign diplomats to remove their protection of diplomatic immunity from a rest and other types of prosecution." Close quote. Why did he become that? In layman's terms, Mr. Peabody was an American diplomat who permanently moved to London in 1837 and who was actively working against the American people during his lifetime in support of Queen Victoria and the British monarchy. What does that mean? Well, to summarize, in the 1840s, the state of Maryland defaulted on its debt, and Mr. Peabody had marketed half of Maryland's securities to individual investors in Europe. He was the key in making that happen. He was working for European investors, not the people of the United States. Not surprising, is it? So he really betrayed the people, yet if we look here for a minute at this article from the Daily Graphic dated February of 1895, we'll see how Mr. Peabody was promoted at the time. So in 1895, that is almost 30 years after his death, I might add, this article claims, quote, the entire civilized world will celebrate the 100th anniversary of one of nature's greatest noblemen, George Peabody. Very few English-speaking persons have not been influenced directly or indirectly by George Peabody's colossal fortune. That fortune is part of contemporary history." Close quote. So all we have to do is change names or faces and dates, and it's the same story, isn't it, with our modern day diplomats. How is it that a betrayer is portrayed as a hero? Money? Using their own words, colossal fortune? See, it's the victors of war that really writes the history. So look at how far this next article takes it in describing elitists like Mr. Peabody. So the headline reads, Nine Immortals. Interesting choice of words, isn't it? Why would they word it this way? And who are they talking about here? Well, one of those men was George Peabody, no less. These quote-unquote immortals were admitted to the Hall of Fame at NYU in New York. It also confirms here that Mr. Peabody was the first American international banker. He was also a philanthropist, which is an unassuming way to describe a wealthy influencer, financially backing certain desires or ideas of their own, or at the request of a more powerful entity. One of the things Mr. Peabody was heavily promoted about by the news outlets of the day was 
the teacher's college he established and funded in Tennessee. It's alleged here that he created, after the Civil War, quote, a board of leading men of the East and South and gave to it three million dollars for use in promoting Southern education, close quote. Mr. Peabody and Mr. Rockefeller have a lot in common, don't they? A curriculum they designed to control the thinking of the masses in this particular area of the United States. Interesting that this was called the Peabody Board of New York. And this board is what was the deciding factor, or boss, if you will, of the new Peabody Normal School located in Nashville, Tennessee. So they love to keep their experiments at arm's length, don't they? Looking at this next article, the emphasis here is, or should I say, one of the things they are emphasizing here is Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria offered him knighthood. And let that sink in for a moment. And what have we learned about those knighted by the British monarchy? They would also like to convince us of his duty to military service, like so many other wealthy elites, like the monarchy. This article goes on to list many of the recipients of Mr. Peabody's fortune, the city of Baltimore, the city of South Danvers, Yale, Harvard, Phillips Andover Academy in Massachusetts, Kenyon College in Ohio, the Peabody Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, along with the Exus Institute, and the city of Newburyport. The library of the Exus Institute in Salem houses all of Mr. Peabody's account books, letters, and private manuscripts from his London office. Where, what an interesting place to keep all of his archives in Salem, Massachusetts. And what is Salem known for? And do you think that that is accidental or should I say coincidental? This article also notes his two quote-unquote outstanding world gifts of three and a half million dollars for the promotion of education in the southern states, or should I say the Bible Belt, and two and a half million to build tenement houses in the city of London. They also dishonestly note that Peabody saved the state of Maryland from bankruptcy. But how could he have done that if he was the one who almost bankrupted them in the first place? I think more importantly here, what we know is that he was financially supplying an American department to participate in the Great Crystal Palace Exposition or Exhibition in England in 1851. Mr. Peabody didn't stop there like most wealthy elite, I'm sorry, philanthropists of today. He funded Arctic expeditions. He was offered a baron's position or the Grand Cross of the Bath by Queen Victoria. Supposedly, he refused these. But how could he? How could you refuse the queen and and not get reprimanded somehow for that. I mean, is there a way that you can do that? I, I, I'm not really sure. But the letter she wrote him is displayed at the Peabody Museum in his native town, also named after him. <laughs> the queen also left him a miniature picture of herself, which is kind of weird or strange in my opinion. And in 1866, he was granted a very unusual honor at the time, the freedom of the city of London. 
and that was also granted to him by Queen Victoria. This all pretty much cements his betrayal of the United States, doesn't it? Along with the fact he was offered an honorary degree from Oxford University, located there in England, his statue was erected and unveiled by the Prince of Wales in 1869. It stands near the Royal Exchange in London. Allow me to conclude with a quote here. Quote, Honored by those in the seats of the mighty of the two continents, George Peabody lived the very last, very plainly, and dressed very simply. His 4th of July dinners in London were noted for their fostering of good feeling between England and America. Close quote. I wonder who they're referring to when they say, seats of the mighty and why were his dinners in london held on the fourth of july allegedly america's birthday and just as a piece of information here the order of the cross of the bath was an honor bestowed to george peabody from queen victoria according to wikipedia this is a British Order of Chivalry founded by King George I on May 18, 1725. It derives from a medieval ceremony for appointing a knight, of which bathing was an element. Knights so created were known as the Knights of the Bath, and George I constituted it a regular military order. What have we learned, though, about bathing rituals of the occult societies? And I'm just going to end on that note. There are so many directions we could go from here, historically speaking, but there were some places mentioned in these articles that we need to look at first. And there are some things that we need to understand, like the Commonwealth and what that means. 